If you don't have a goal, you suffer and then you get cruel and bitter and resentful and then you start to actively try to make the world a worse place. Mm. You have to be willing to accept that what you think you should get might not be right. If you don't agree, don't agree. Fight or hold your peace because you see what happens. We must have an aim in our life no matter what stage of life we're mm -hmm. in. And if we don't have some type of aim, even mm -hmm. if for a few months of an aim of going somewhere or direction, mm -hmm. we're gonna, the suffering's gonna be even more suffering. Mm -hmm. because, Pointless. Because we're already gonna face the greatest challenges in That's life. That's right, you're we're stuck with We're already struggling. That's right, there's no way Adversity out of Adversity is coming no matter what. That's right. If we have big goals or mm -hmm. small little goal or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. but it's gonna be less suffering if we mm -hmm. have an aim. Yeah, well, and, and not only, the, it's worse than that even because the suffering is <laughs> pain. zero meaning. Well, yeah. the suffering is pain and the suffering is anxiety and uncertainty and the suffering is hopelessness. But the consequence of all that is that you get bitter. And mm. when you get bitter, you get mean and you get cruel and you start to hurt yourself and other people. So it's not only that if you don't have a goal, you suffer. It's that you, if you don't have a goal, you suffer and then you get cruel and bitter and resentful and then you start to actively try to make the world a worse place. Mm. And so, so it, because you can't <clears throat> suffer pointlessly without becoming bitter and you can't become bitter without becoming cruel. So you need an aim. The question is, then the question of course is aim. what you should aim. Yeah, <laughs> a yeah, better aim. yeah, a better aim, <laughs> that's for sure. So then the question is, what should your aim be? Now we have a program. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about yeah. today. I, I have this website called selfauthoring.com and that program helps people write about their life. And so there's a past authoring program. To, to, to establish your aim, you have to know where you are. It's like you're trying to orient yourself on a map. You can't orient yourself on a map unless you know where you are. You yeah. also have to know where you're going, right? So those are the two relevant things. The past authoring program helps people write about their lives. So it's a guided autobiography. We ask people to break their life up into six epochs, six sections, and then to write about the emotionally important events in those, in those epochs and to detail out why, why the positive things happened and why more of that could conceivably happen in the future and to detail out why the negative things happened and to try to understand why with an aim to not replicating them in the future. Because the purpose of memory isn't to remember the past. The purpose of memory is so that you, you figure out what went wrong when something went wrong so you don't duplicate it in mm. the future. So that's yeah. the purpose of memory. And the past authoring program can help people catch up. And you know you have to catch up if you have memories that are older than about a year and a half that still cause you emotional pain when you mm. think about them. Or if you dwell on them, they come spontaneously back to mind. It means you haven't, it means that there's part of your life that you haven't mapped out properly and it still has emotional valence that's gripping you. And you're still you holding to on to that story. Or it's yeah. still holding on to you. Mm, interesting. Right, you haven't right. let it go. Yeah. yeah, well you haven't been able to navigate your way through it. You, there's a pitfall there that you fell in and you don't know how to avoid similar pitfalls in the future and that's why so your you brain won't it. let it go. Because oh. it's saying that's what the anxiety systems do. It's like, this happened to you, it wasn't good. This happened to you, it wasn't good. This happened to you, it wasn't good. Fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. That will never go away unless you fix it. How do you fix it? Well, you have to figure out why it happened, right? That's the first thing is like, how did you, how was it that that situation arose to pull you down? Mm -hmm. And that's not simple. That's why, well, that's why we have the writing program because right. it's complicated to think <clears throat> it through. But you, but if you face it and you, and you meditate on it, let's say, and, so, and you do this voluntarily, there's a pretty high probability that you'll be able to decrease the probability that will be repeated in the future. So, and this, and, <clears throat> go ahead, I don't want to cut you Oh, well, well we, the, the second part of the program helps people do an analysis of their virtues and their faults, mm. same sort of idea. What's good about you that you could capitalize on? What's weak about you that you need to fix so that it doesn't bring you down, right? And that's the present authoring, but the future authoring program is probably most relevant to mm. you and your listeners because you're interested in helping people establish aims. And so we already talked about the fact that you need an aim in life or, or that's where you derive your meaning and without that things go to hell and and as literally as that can be taken and so but it's not easy to, to ask people to say well it's easy to ask them what do you want in your life it's a very hard question to answer because it's too right. vague right, and, right, right. and grand eh? so we help in the future authoring program we help people break that down it's okay so here's here's the situation so you put yourself in the right frame of mind 
So what's the right frame of mind? It's like rule two in this book. Treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping. You're someone that you are responsible for helping. So what that means is you have to start from the presupposition that despite all your flaws and insufficiencies, that it's worth having you around and that it would be okay if things were better for you. So you need to take care of yourself like you're taking care of someone you care for. So there's a bit of a detachment in that. And then the next thing is, okay, so now look three to five years down the road. Okay, you get to have what you need and want, assuming you're being reasonable mm -hmm. and that you actually want it, which means you're willing to make the sacrifices that would, that would make it possible. What do you mean by reasonable? Well, that, that's, that's the next thing. Well, within your grasp, that would be something. What if you something know, is out of your grasp, but you still push hard enough well, to then you need, get it? Then you need an incremental plan, Got right? It. You yeah, need yeah, to course. break that goal down into steps Not that you... Not some crazy goal within a year that's yeah. like, you yeah. haven't even done the work to master a skill yet. Yeah, I got yeah it. well, that's it. And you can have a high-end goal and more right. power to you if you but do, but you frame. need it. Yeah. Well, you need a pathway to yeah, it. Absolutely. You know, if, you're, if it's 10 stories up above you, you need a staircase to get there, right? right? And so you have to build the staircase too. Right. Right. And so in the future authoring program, so you're asked, first of all, okay, here's, you get to have what you want and need. That's the proposition. But you have to aim at it. You have to define it and aim at it. So, here, so then the first thing is, okay, uh, if you could put your family together the way you wanted it to be, what mm -hmm. would that look like? And mm -hmm. so that might be your siblings and your parents, but that also might be, you know, your wife or your husband and your kids, assuming that you're at that point in your life. If you could have the family you wanted, what would that look like? Right, okay. Career. Same thing. You get to have the career or the job that, that is within your grasp, necessary and, and suitable for, for you if you mm -hmm. were taking care of yourself. How are you going to educate yourself? Because you're not as smart as you should be. There's a lot more things you need to know. So you've got to keep learning and moving mm -hmm. forward. So you need to plan for that. How are you going to take care of yourself mentally and physically? Right. So um, how are you going to avoid the, the, the catastrophic temptations, for example, of drugs and alcohol, because that pulls a lot of people down. You need a plan for that. You're going to be a social drinker. How much are you going to drink? How much is too much? What about your drug use? Mm. You've got to regulate that so it isn't a pitfall. How are you going to use your time meaningful and productively outside of work? Because you need a plan for that. So that's, um, and there's one other that, that I, that's slipped in my mind said, at the right? moment. Yeah, I think there's seven <clears throat> yeah. initial questions, and I don't, I don't remember the last one. Um, Oh, intimate relationship, of course. Mm -hmm. So you have, you, do you want, do you want a long-term, stable, intimate relationship? And if you do, then how would you like that to lay itself out? You got to have a vision for that because if you don't have a vision, you're not going to aim at it. Absolutely. And if you don't aim at it, then you won't even see the opportunities when they arise. That's the thing that's so cool. I wrote about this in chapter ten, which is be precise in your speech. It's a chapter about the fact that aims structure your perceptions. So, for example, once you aim at something. Your brain, literally, the perceptual structures in your brain, in your visual cortex, reorient themselves to calculate a pathway to the aim. And then what they show you in the world is obstacles to that path and, mm -hmm. and open pathways to the path. That's actually how the world reveals itself. Just like, just like when you're driving in a car and you have a map and you, or you aim at a particular place, then all the things that right. are related to that place show up in the world. It's exactly the same thing. Because yeah. you are traveling through time and space. Right? And you need a map. And so, so after you answer these seven questions, and you're encouraged to do it badly, because mm -hmm. you don't have to Just get perfectionistic. Yeah. Just complete it. <laughs> right? Because a bad plan is better than no plan. It gives you something to improve. Mm -hmm. So even if your aim is vague, and even if it's off target, if you start aiming and you see you're off target, then you can shift and you can make it more precise. You start to recognize what you don't want in that. Aim. Yes, exactly. Say, exactly. Oh, I thought I wanted this, but I don't. Exactly. So let me re-navigate and figure out what I do exactly. want. Exactly. And, and you might have to try a bunch of things. You, well, you will have to. You right. can be. That's why you shouldn't get perfectionistic about it. You will absolutely be wrong, but you won't be as wrong as you would have been if you were aimless. Right. Right. So it's a. So there's a bit of no humility. man's land. No man's land is, is not worse good. than. Going no man's somewhere. room is a b worse than a bad path. Yeah. That's exactly right. Ooh, I like that. That's, the, that's, that's a good, a good one. <laughs> that's a good one, and it's right. It's right. You don't want to be in no man's land. Why did you use that phrase? Because that's right. That's exactly I right. I think um, for me, uh, the idea of walking around aimlessly is like the worst idea in the world. It's like zero purpose, zero mission, zero certainty at all. It's well, like it, walking around in no man's land right. aim, aimlessly. But it's funny, too, because in no man's land, everybody's shooting at you. Because right? that's a military term. Right. In no man's land is the space in between the middle two enemy positions. Yeah, yeah. You bet. So if you're aimless, 
you're also at a place where everything is shooting at you. Dang. Yeah, so it's a very good that's metaphor deep. that came to mind. Wow. Yeah, well, that's why, that why we worked on it. That's very, very <laughs> cool. So then we say to people, okay, look, now, okay, now you've thought about this for a while. It's nice to do this over a couple of days, too, because mm -hmm. then you get to sleep on it, and that helps reorient yourself. Yes. So then, okay, now you write for 20 minutes. Don't worry about grammar or spelling. This isn't a, this isn't a, a composition exercise, right? You get to have what you want three to five years down the road. What does your life look like, hypothetically? Mm -hmm. Write it out, yeah. write it out. Okay, so then that's the first part. The second part of the exercise is, so now you've got your thing to aim at. You think, well, I'm motivated because I got my thing to, thing to aim at. Yeah. It's like, you're not as motivated as you could be because you don't yet have your thing to run away from. Because if you really want to be motivated, you want to be going somewhere and you want to be not going somewhere else. Which typically is a pain, mm -hmm. right? Yes, or, or pain a, or a anxiety, or yeah, yeah. Some, some domain of suffering and guilt, yeah. let's I don't say. want to feel this anymore. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so the other thing we ask people is, okay, now take stock of your weaknesses and imagine that you let them multiply, you got hopeless, mm -hmm. and you augured in and things were as bad for you as they could be in three to five years. What are some examples of weaknesses that people might have? They lie. Uh -huh. They procrastinate, yeah. they avoid, they're grandiose, they're narcissistic, they're undisciplined, uh, they're nihilistic, they're aimless, all of those things, Got it, yeah. right? Um, victim they, mentality. Victim yeah. mentality, they take the, sh they take the, the, the quick way out, they mm -hmm. pursue impulsive <clears throat> pleasures, they sacrifice meaning for expediency, they don't take care of their basic responsibilities, they fight stupidly <clears throat> with their parents, they don't, they don't negotiate properly with their spouse, they're bitter at work because they haven't said what they have to say. Mm. They haven't thought through what they're doing tomorrow. They drink too much. They smoke too much. They take too many drugs. They don't regulate their... Don't their, work out. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so there's like... Got and so everyone knows, weaknesses. man. Yeah. Everyone knows. And everyone's got a set of weaknesses yeah. that they know about. And so we say, all right... What are some of your weaknesses? Like three weaknesses <clears throat> that you know right now you could still work on and then three things that you think are really... Well, a lot of things. In. A lot of things are things that I've taken care of in my life. Like right. I used to smoke when I was a kid. I smoked a pack a day. I used to drink a lot. I didn't work out. Like there, 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 I wasn't nearly as disciplined as I should have been. Yeah. Um, I wasn't as careful with what I was saying. Like I, there, and I, I suppose loose. my yeah. most likely negative outcome probably would have been I really liked to drink. Like alcohol is a really good drug for me. Is that I enjoyed why you did your lot. thesis on that? Um, well, partly. It, it was mostly because the opportunity came up for me uh, to, to investigate drug and alcohol mm -hmm. use. But I came from a little town in northern Alberta. It was a heavy drinking town. And, yeah. and uh, that, that could have been a real trap for me. Right. You know, and, 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 and so anyway, so we have these people who say, okay, now you know your weaknesses. And you know what particular hell you would descend to if you allowed yourself to descend into it because you've probably had a taste of it. It's like you really let that go and you're in a terrible place in three to five years because you haven't done what you should do. What does that look like? It's like everybody writes Write that it down. down. Yeah. Write it down so you know because one of the things you want to have behind you, let's say you have to do something difficult like go confront your boss. It's like, well, maybe hope isn't enough to encourage you to do that. You think, well, no, if I don't encourage... If I don't go confront my boss carefully and mm -hmm. intelligently, right. then I'm going to hate my job and then I'm going to drink more. Then I'm going to end up in that little hell place that I designed for myself. It's right. like, oh, I'm not going there. Well, I don't want to talk to my boss or I don't want to confront my wife or my husband, whatever it is, or my father or my children for that matter. But if I don't... Then I'll resent myself or resent the situation. I'm going to end up going and, yeah. down this yeah. terrible pathway. It's like, yeah. because sometimes... When you're moving forward, you have to do something difficult. And you might think, well, why bother? And the answer is, well, so I don't end up in hell. Yeah, How yeah. about that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's that. Because <laughs> it's a so, deep. If you don't uh, experience the pain now or the difficulty now, you're going to have a deeper pain later. Yeah, yeah, that's life. Much man. deeper pain yeah. later. What are your thoughts on this? Having a dream that is inside of your soul for years that you never fully commit to. You never, you dabble, again, like we've done so much in so many things, we dabble, but you never fully commit to, what does that do to us if we continue on for the rest of our life, never fully going all in on our dreams? I think it obviously reinforces the, the idea of incompetence or it reinforces the idea that you are incapable of following through. And I feel like you, we have an obligation to, follow that or as you say put it put it aside entirely and what's the you know look we all know in the grim economies of our lives if we were to put aside staring at 
some goddamn senseless social media platform and give that time to learn in Spanish. We'd speak Spanish by now. Or, we'd be you know, so like, in four languages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, I, I, you have to be willing. And that's why someone like, you know, Tony Robbins is so sort of, you think, because that man, he just makes those choices. Mm-hmm. Like, have you ever heard him tell the story about how he, like, learned polo? He's just like, I was like, yes. I want to yeah. learn polo. Oh, I'm fing ill. <laughs> like, every time I come, whenever I'm walking my dog, I feel like, and uh, I, I'm friends with Tony, and I've told him this. I say, like, whenever I'm walking my dog or anything, like, I feel like, oh, this is not... Um, Tony wouldn't be doing this. Tony would be learning something now. Well, you know, you could be learning Spanish while you walk the dog. <laughs> you know, like, he, I mean, he's powerful, but he is a, <laughs> he's a one-off, let's face it. Yeah, I just actually interviewed him again yesterday, and it reminded me that he learned, I think, to become a black belt, like, while he was on tour for two or three years, and he was like... I did it the fastest time anyone's been a black belt. I had the master come on stage and like behind the scenes, in between sessions, I would spend 45 minutes, then go back on stage. I was like, you're an animal. It, the commitment is unbelievable. What was that? Like what martial art is that? that I think learned? he just learned, I think he learned karate. I think it was what, it, he, this was probably decades ago when he was oh, like, man. I'm gonna learn this, but I'm on tour. And he brought the guy with him to just teach him all day in between on stage. So it's One of the things I level. most admire about him is that he's the way that he will identify an objective and then not be restricted by sort of our conditioned, either emotional or cultural responses. You know, admittedly, we're talking about someone with some incredible resources. Yes, we are now, but the reason he's got those resources is because of this ability that he will just go, okay, I'm gonna learn that thing. Never put aside all of the, yeah, there's not time, there's not this, there's mm-hmm. not that. You know he eliminates I mean? excuses. He just he says there is no room, and he goes all in on his desires. It's it's pretty powerful. Uh, Tony, you exhausting genius. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things I think that holds a lot of uh, people back, myself included, is when we doubt ourselves, when we, when we don't believe in our, in our own abilities or what we're capable of creating in the future. What do you think are some ways that we can overcome self-doubt in ourselves to gain that real confidence, not fake confidence, um, but overcome the doubts that hold us back from, you know, asking that person out or going after that career opportunity or just saying, I'm going to go after what I want in my life. What are some ways to eliminate that self-doubt and gain confidence? Well, Self-doubt can be critical, Lewis, because it can be a component of awareness. I feel that the answer must always be the embarkation on a spiritual life because uh, it's difficult, isn't it, in this world of personal development that we find ourselves in for us not to take on the tropes and objectives of a culture that I think at this point we need to be querying querying and looking to move away from. We've all been deeply inculcated to believe that the pursuit of happiness is contingent upon the attainment of our petty, trivial desires. (laughs) But real (laughs) happiness is contingent on being free from those petty, trivial Mm -hmm. desires as long as i'm a prisoner to that like you know see if someone's like that that doesn't know you know don't can't pluck up the confidence to ask someone out or can't pluck up the confidence to pursue their dream or whatever for me i don't feel like it's my job to operate at that 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 intersection at the intersection of well come on believe in yourself you're as good as anyone else you never know unless you try you know i don't think that's my job my job is like Why do you think you want this? What do you think it's going to do for you? What do you want really? What do you really want? What do you really want? What is it you are looking for? You know, a friend of mine observed once that in the 1980s, the prominent sort of entrepreneurs were all about zipping about on speedboats and whooshing through the skies in hot air balloons, intrepid, bold adventurers. The very same tycoons now are all about greenness and ecology and safety and helping responding to the trends that define a time this time now of apparent fragility 
I think our job is to look for some truth beneath culture. That culture in many cases is not our friend. Culture is here to chain us to systems of tyranny, subtle tyranny. What is freedom really if it is only freedom to operate within certain parameters? It isn't freedom at all. I'm not saying I wouldn't rather be a person who is affluent in California than a person that's sort of poor in, I don't know, Tehran or Senegal or, you know, I'm going to be poor anywhere, frankly. It's pretty grim to be poor in anywhere in the world. I've been poor in places before. But I don't feel like our job is to train people to bend themselves into a shape where they can succeed within these systems. I think our job is to train people so that they learn to challenge these systems, to create fairer systems that are not solely mm -hmm. built upon the fulfillment of individual goals. My friend Adam Curtis, the great filmmaker and genius says the genie is out of the bottle now on individualism it's never going back in you're never going to be able to tell people hey why don't you forget your own identity you're just a member of a community of a collective of a parish you know that's not going to happen now everyone live nothing is as real to you or i as our own thoughts as our own dreams as our own but that's just the way it is now but perhaps through this we can attain some meaning and if i refer back even to my own suggestions serve the thing you are pursuing you know if it's like you really want to go out of a a boy or a girl why are you looking to serve them or do you think they're going to somehow solve or absolve you you see them as some salve or if you're after some dream why is it because you don't feel like you're good enough or you're worthy you know m one of my friends said like to me that you're like someone who's been up to the all you can eat buffet table stuffed your face full of everything and then going to everyone else you don't need this stuff <laughs> you don't need it <laughs> this, this yeah. cake won't work for you but, You've done you know, it, yeah. <laughs> but I have had this experience. So you know, you know, anyone that's saying, "Well, that's easy for you to say," then yeah, god damn it, they're right. Well, it wasn't that easy to get here. Let me tell you. Mm -hmm. And like, so, but what I would say is, this is I would say, I would say this that you are beautiful, that you are mm. enough, that you deserve to feel content and happy, but. You have to be willing to surrender everything. You have to be willing to surrender everything. You have to be willing to accept that what you think you should get might not be right. Where did it come from, that idea? Where did that idea that, you know, because if you are meant to be a world-class athlete, if you get on and do, you know what I mean, do the Tony Robbins version of get on and do the work, don't let anything stand in your way, believe in it, be willing to suffer have the discipline ha make the sacrifices then that's all sort of cool but if the only reason you're becoming a world-class athlete it's because your father told you you're not good enough and that you're cheap and you ain't no kind of a man mm -hmm. or woman or whatever then pff, that you're gonna need to deal with that sh otherwise right. you're gonna be, end up strung up in a hotel room one way or another you know because it doesn't like you know like you and i both know enough people like i've having experienced the type of celebrity that i experienced I've met people that, are, as I'm sure you have, that are in at the apex, the zenith. They have mm -hmm. enjoyed it. They have been to Kublai Khan. They've had it. They're in there drowning in riches and drowning indeed because mm. it's not real. Mm. It's not real. Never lose sight of the fact that we are in limitless space in every direction. Never lose sight of the fact that in the subparticular world, the rules of physics as we previously understood them are falling apart. Never lose sight of the fact that our senses are limited and we can only only see 0.63 percent of the electromagnetic range that we are operating essentially in darkness that the neural activity that we experience that constitutes our reality is only a tiny percentage of the potential of our own brain let alone the potential brain of god wouldn't it be a coincidence mm. if we were issued with all of the senses necessary to experience total reality isn't it more likely that we think of reality as just being the circumference of our sensual world so there are limitless experiences as you Unhead and many uh, 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 unhad and many of them lay in the realm of mystery. Engage mm. with the mystery. Meditate. Pursue these spiritual disciplines. Don't rely entirely on the material path. This is not like you know neglect the body or hate the body. Love the body. We are in this material world. We are God made flesh. We are having this experience in bodies. But I don't think you can take what this culture is offering you as a solution and think that it will be a solution. You'll be disappointed the map is not the territory the map is not the territory when you get there it's not like that it's not like that so you start where you are start with you now absolutely absolutely 
I have about 17 more hours of questions, but I'm going to ask you about four final questions to respect our time. And maybe we can do another follow up in the future with the next book you have. This book, Revelation, I, it's hard for me to finish books. It's really hard for me to finish them with, a, you know, growing up with a learning disability, reading and writing was not my forte. Um, but I finished it and it was beautiful. It was unbelievable spoken uh, word poetry. Uh, and I, I, don't know how, I don't know how you do what you do. It's an incredible gift and a talent and people just need to listen, listen to it just to hear how talented you are as a spoken uh, word artist. It's unbelievable. But the way you were able, we had many, and many of the people that you mentioned throughout there, I've had the fortune of knowing and interviewing Wim Hof and all these yeah. other individuals. Yeah, I went to Poland. I took 13 guys to Poland last year and did five days with Wim and, you know, have had him on many times and had some great kind of spiritual experiences in Poland with him playing the guitar, singing and us jumping in ice rivers and climbing up mountains naked in the snow and, you know, crazy stuff. That we that we did together, our friend Jay Shetty connected us, and I've done you know many weeks in India meditating at different places, and I'm on a constant journey for myself, and that's why I really wanted to have this conversation with you. And there's many things I want to ask you, uh, hopefully for another time. But I grew up in a religion called Christian Science. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Christian Science, but there's a uh, it's a lot about the things you've been talking about and the things you talk about in your in your audiobook on Audible. Um, and one of the things that the founder, her name is Mary Baker Eddy, said back in the 1800s was Stan Porter at the door of thought. And that really stood with me as a child growing up in this religion. I'm no longer really active in the church or anything, but the foundation is still with me of the mindset. Stan Porter at the door of thought. And I'm curious, how do you manage negative thoughts when they try to enter your mind? What's your practice beyond meditation and the things you talk about in your book and your YouTube channel, which is incredible, but how do you really navigate negative thoughts that come, come into mind, the thoughts of addiction, the thoughts of lust or greed or fame or whatever the things that are coming to you that you've tasted, this buffet you've tasted for years, how do you manage that? Well, Lewis, what I do is I don't try and do it alone. You know, like I think that's a very beautiful piece of uh, language and a lovely experience you just shared with me, mate. And the way that, like, I experience negative thoughts a lot. I experience a lot of fear and, uh, you know, like all of the things that you've listed. Here's a very practical way that I deal with it. I'm like, I felt like I was looking at social media too long, in particular, like, you know, I'm like, when I do YouTube videos, I feel like I'm justified in checking, oh, how many views did it get, you know, and what are the comments? But I work with people that can handle that. I'm not qualified to handle that sort of stuff because otherwise I get, I go into a point where I'm sort of numbed by it. Like, it's not like the, the people saying nice things really helps me or the people saying bad things really hurts me. It's like a sort of a numb, dumb stare. And so, uh, like, I sort of, you know, then someone reached out to me, who's like a famous uh, uh, musician, she sort of told me I'm like looking at stuff too much. And I goes, all right, well, from now on, right, one day at a time, me and you, whenever we're thinking about doing that, let's reach out to each other, you know? And like, so I start doing it with her. Hey, I'm thinking of doing it now. And we talk about the feelings that we have and what it elicits in us mm. when we want to do it and what it feels like to not do it. You know, if you want to know if you're addicted to something, see what happens to you when you stop doing it. Then you will know. Then you will know. Oh, I'm not, I could stop any time. Stop then. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> and like then, oh my God, I'm ashamed. I'm full of fear. Ah! <laughs> and then like, you know, similar with uh, pornography. If I don't want to mm -hmm. look at pornography, but you know, not judgment on anyone else who does, but like for me, if I think, oh no, I don't like how I feel, how it accumulatively makes me feel, then... I make a choice that I'm going to reach out to someone else who's you know, sometimes it helps specifically with that thing. You know, like I've done it before with someone like my mate didn't want to like eat no more bad food. And I, I was cool with food at that time. So I was like, well, I don't want to look at porn. So if I'm when I want to look at porn, I'll check you, you with the food. You know, so we do it like and it's not even and that's non hierarchical, by the way. We're both sort of people that are just sort of trying it and trying to improve ourselves together. I also have mentors that I've, evidently you do like the further down the path than me and like you know for me i tend to use the mentors in a with a broader you know with a broader strokes like you know this is how i'm feeling about family this is how i'm feeling about being a man this is how i'm feeling about fatherhood work whatever it is you know i check in with them and then you've got to listen to them then you already like see if you you know if you have the privilege of access to people like wim hoff or tony robbins 
and you ask Tony Robbins, what should I do? And then Tony Robbins tells you, do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, you know, like, you know, and then like, then you're suddenly, you've got Tony Robbins' brain then. You're mm-hmm. running off of that. You know, now like, a lot of the time, what Tony Robbins tells you <laughs> might be <laughs> unachievable. <laughs> okay, all you got to do is become a black ball in world realm. Oh, fucking hell. Tell me something easier. Like, you know, like, and, or like, you know, sort of like with, um, you know, with Wim Hof or whatever, all these sort of peculiar yogis and genii. We've lost sacredness, broadly speaking, in our culture. That's what that book is about. How do you reconnect mm-hmm. with sacredness after we've sort of decided, oh, those ideas, they're old fashioned. They don't really work. They're not for me. Or they've become compromised by their own you know, hypocrisy or dogma or whatever it is. You know, I like you've got like for me, it becomes find it everywhere. Find it everywhere. Find and every conversation what is the sacredness what is the beauty of the person that you are dealing with what mm-hmm. is your job in this moment are you taking or are you giving like yeah. and and i have to legitimately ask myself these questions all the time because and you know god the only advantage that i have over someone like tony robbins is i think like i'm still in it like you know i talk to tony robbins or eckhart toll or whoever and i think my god these people are like in their own ways transcended masters Mm -hmm. like so like it's like if you're asking you know sort of uh, maradona about football like you know god rest his soul like you know like he can't tell you what he does he doesn't know how he does that no one knows that's the like the point of it you know like but, but some of us is like look i'm on like every day I know like you know like I think I say in, in, in that book I certainly say it places like you know Eckhart Tolle he lives there he lives in the awakened state moment to moment fully present return to the present like you know he's sort of like he says the second he comes off the stage from talking that experience is done that's it you can never be happy in the conceptual mind whenever you're thinking anything whenever you're comparing or projecting you the conceptual mind will always make you unhappy it can't make you happy you know like that and like so but for me i go to those places lewis i get there but I come back all the time. I come right, back for right, the right. chocolate. I come back, you know. I feel, <laughs> oh my God, glory of God, we're all one. Right, I'm just going to have a bit of chocolate or have a wank. You know, like, I <laughs> can't, can't get out of the mud. You know, right, the right. mud the is in me. The monkey mind. Yeah, the monkey mind. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. How do we start to heal the, the memories of the past, the traumas of the past, uh, so that they don't keep hurting us in the present? Well, the first thing I would say is, you know, sometimes there's a crisis and well-meaning mental health professionals rush in to discuss the trauma while it's still happening. Mm -hmm. That's a really bad idea. Mm. People are generally traumatized because something actually horrible happened. And dwelling on it in the moment just makes it worse. It's not like anybody has a solution. Here's how you should understand this. You know, someone's just shot up your kid's school. Here's how you should understand this. That'll make it all better. It's like, no, it won't. Mm. If you have old baggage, that often comes up if you're having an argument with someone, doesn't it? You know how it you know how it is. This is partly why people don't like to have a dispute within a relationship because it's a thread and you pull on that thread and just God. <laughs> oh, that we had another rule. Do not agree with something you don't agree with. Ooh. Like if we're gonna, if we decide, you and me, that we're doing this, we don't go back and say, Well, I didn't really mean it. Mm. We don't get to play revisionist with our history. So if you if you don't agree. Don't agree, fight, object, or hold your peace. Mm -hmm. Because you see what happens with couples is there's a little fight. And then one says to the other, yeah, but you did this. And then that person says, yeah, I know I did that. But then that was because you did this. And (laughs) each this gets bigger until what's on the table is why the hell should we stay together at all? Right. And so every fight becomes, why the hell should we stay together at all? So that's another thing you want to do is you want to have the fight about this thing. Not about everything. About the past. Not everything. It's like, okay, you were flirting. I think you were flirting more than you should have been. Okay. So I go away and I think, well, okay, maybe I was. Okay. um, Well, then we have to have a discussion about why. 
And maybe we can solve that. But mostly what we have to do is figure out how to not have that happen again. Okay, so we're going to go see the same couple again. What is it that you want me to do? So I'm the flirtatious one, let's say. What do you want me to do? Well, you have to figure that out. It's like, no, I'm stupid. Like you. We're equally stupid. I need right. to know what would satisfy you. And you need to figure out what would satisfy you so I know. And that, like, that's also extremely useful is let your con- establish your conditions of satisfaction, make them explicit, let the other person know. Yeah, you can't read someone's mind. Yeah. We're very bad at that. <laughs> We're bad at reading our own minds for that matter. Yeah. So if, we, if I have a fight with, with Tammy, let's say, sometimes I remember to say, okay, what, what do you want me to do right now? What can I do? What, what should I say and mean? You know, and you think, well, you shouldn't let the other person put words in your mouth. Well, fair enough. You know, I'm not, act, I'm not asking for something false. I'm saying, I'd like to not have this happen. Can you see a way out? Is there something I could do to increase the probability that that's the route we could take? And, you know, sometimes that works. But the other person has to let you know what they would find satisfying. You mentioned you mentioned sexual shame, um, and it triggered something in me about just the shames of the past that people tend to hold on to. I think I, I might have mentioned this to you the last time we talked. I'm not sure if you know, but I was I was sexually abused when I was five by a man that I didn't know, and for 25 years I held on to the secret, the shame. Uh, and if anyone ever knew about this, then I would never be loved. I you know I right because you I, feel contaminated eh, permanently. I, yeah, I would you know. I wouldn't have any guy friends. No girls would find me attractive. My parents would disown me. You know, I went down the rabbit hole of these stories of, you know, I'm the only one this has ever happened to. I never saw any examples of this happening to. Right. Uh, And about eight years ago, I I started to really heal that and start sharing that shame in in many different therapeutic experiences that allowed me to start the healing process. Uh, I'm curious from your perspective with all the work that you've done, what is the best approach for someone to really heal their shame? If whether it's around sexual abuse or trauma or just anything, whether it be small or big or any type of shame that they might have, how does someone release shame in a healthy manner so that it doesn't make them a prisoner of these emotions of the past that hold them back? Well, you hinted at a few things when you just described what what happened to you. Is you said, well. First of all, you know, I thought I was the only person this had ever happened to. It's like, no, it's a universal human experience to one degree or another. Now, you know, I'm not saying everyone was sexually abused, and I'm certainly not saying that some people aren't sexually abused to a degree that's so extreme, it's unimaginable where there are others, you know, get off relatively lightly, but it's still, it's, It's well within the realm of normative human experience that sexual, that sex goes wrong in some way. At least you regret something that's happened, something you've done or something that was done to you. So putting it in to, when when you're the only person that something has happened to, that's really not good, Mm. right? because it alienates you even from yourself. You have no idea what to do with that. And so that's sometimes why people find it such a relief to have their illness diagnosed. It's like, oh, there is, this is known. There's a category. Other people have had this experience. Maybe there's a pathway through it. Mm. So just knowing that you're not the only person like that can be very helpful. Um, updating, it's like, how you were how old? Five. Okay, well, one thing to realize when you're 25 and you were abused when you're five is that you're not five anymore. Right. Right? That the person to whom that happened is no longer there. You're there. But so, you know, you might feel afraid of relationships. You might feel afraid of all sorts of things. But a lot of that was you're sort of feeling that like that residual Mm five-year-old. I tell a story about one client I had she was abused by her older brother. And she told me the story and I drew a picture in my head while she was, you know, I kind of pictured her of at five and this teenage hulking teenager, 
you know, taking advantage of her. But as she told the story, I realized that her older brother was only a year, two years older than her. Mm. While he was seven, was like, okay, well, they were, she wasn't the victim of a tyrannical male in some sense. She, they were two badly supervised children. Now, that doesn't mean that what he did was right, but she was still the five-year-old in the memory, but she was 27 when, or so when she came to see me. And so the first thing I did was just point that out. It's like, think about the seven-year-olds you know, mm-hmm. right? From, for a five-year-old, a seven-year-old is an adult, but for an adult, a seven and a five-year-old are clearly both children. Well, that just changed things somewhat. It, it made her feel less vulnerable in the moment. What your brain wants from you in relationship to a traumatic memory is indication that you're no longer vulnerable to the same problem. That's what memory is for, right? Mm -hmm. You remember something bad and you process it so that you change your interpretation or your behavior or the situation or whatever you can change so that it isn't going to happen in the future. And that'll, if you do that thoroughly, you'll generally let yourself rest. Mm. It's to, you have the memory to protect yourself from it happening again. Well, that's the purpose of memory in general. Right. You, 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 you make sense of your past behavior so that bet, the good things that happen to you can be duplicated and the bad things can be avoided. It's not to make an objective record of the world. Mm. It's to make a functional map of the world that you can apply to the future. And so, so how part we, of... Yeah, how do we let that go? How do we disassociate something that happened a year ago, 10, 20 years ago, that is no longer happening, but is seems to be triggering us? Oh, it's very, it's, it's very difficult. Well, I would say, you know, one of the things you need to develop, if you've had an experience like the one you had, perhaps, because I don't know the details, you probably need a theory of malevolence. You need an explanation. Mm. It's like, how could a person do that? Well, you have to have an... What if the explanation isn't good? They were just bad person. They just... Well, then you need a philosophy of bad. Mm. You need a philosophy of evil. You have to understand it so that you're no longer a victim of it. Uh. You have... Because otherwise you can't put the event in in a context. Right. You know, and sometimes that means the development of real... A real philosophical sophistication. And that can help because then you know, then you can start to separate out malevolence from benevolence because maybe you're afraid of any intimate relationship now because it's been contaminated with that and everything's fuzzy and foggy. And so you need to understand the person who did that, at least to some degree, so that you can separate that person out from all the other people around you who, that you encounter in situations that might be reminiscent of it. You know, so you you felt vulnerable for, for perhaps you felt ashamed. All those things have to be gone through. What do you think? You know, when you're ashamed, when does what elicits that? Mm-hmm. What are the eliciting cues? What do you think when that happens? All of that has to be taken apart. I said in this Beyond Order book that you know, if you have a memory older than about eighteen months, that still bothers you, right? It's still got emotional resonance that older, you should write 18, it out. Older than 18 months ago or before? Yeah. No, older than eight, 18 months ago or more. Got it. Yep. Otherwise, it's not really in the past, right? It's still happening. Mm. That, that, that Whether you should delve into something, how you should delve into something traumatic that's currently happening is a whole different issue. But if it's an old memory and it still bothers you, it means that you haven't decomposed that experience sufficiently to detach it from the emo- emotion. So imagine when something terrible happens to you, you don't understand it. Mm-hmm. So then you might say, well, if you don't understand something that's happening to you, how can it be terrible? Because doesn't terrible mean that you understand it? And the, the answer is, well, you understand things in stages. And the first way you understand a terrible thing is by freezing in terror or running. That's the understanding. It's not conceptual. It's embodied and emotional. And so event terror, that's the first category. Okay, now the next question is how do you get it out? How do you get out of the terror? Well, 
you realize that nothing truly dangerous is happening. Well, what if something truly dangerous did happen? Mm -hmm. Then you elaborate your view of the world to the point where you're no longer vulnerable to that terrible thing. And that's extremely difficult. So mm. the memory of something terrible stays terrible until you effortfully process it and decompose it into, well, often into a much more sophisticated map of the world. And it's really hard to do that. What, what's the thing in your life that was the hardest to do to, to deconstruct after the event so that it didn't consume you emotionally from the initial terror because you study this you practice this you teach this stuff but when it, you know as a practitioner teaching it is there a, was there a time where you were like man this is really hard for me to understand oh absolutely <laughs> it's chronic i mean that state is chronic for me at the moment i would mm -hmm. say partly because i've become so insanely famous and i have difficulty with that for sure mm -hmm. it's very difficult to understand i'm i'm and so, and I wouldn't say I've managed it. I'm managing it, I suppose. But, and then health trouble that has hit my family and me, it's been so devastating that I'm, I'm, I haven't managed that either. Like, you know, that's the thing. I, I suggest to people, no, that isn't even that. It's that, what have I found that you do about terrible things? Generally, you don't run from them, mm. especially if they're not avoidable in the future. Generally, you stand, confront, decompose, understand, adapt. But just because you generally do that and it's the best bet doesn't mean it's definitely going to work. It's just the best shot you have at it. You know, it'd be lovely if something always worked, but if something always worked, people would never get sick and die. Right. And we do all the time. Mm -hmm. So we do our best, but that doesn't mean that that always works, but it's still the best that can be done. Yeah. It's still better than all the alternatives. So how do you, how do you, how do you cultivate your own personal inner peace amongst the different uh, changes that have come up, whether, you know, the fame, the, health challenges, uh, personally, maybe challenges with family or friends. How do you personally keep a level of inner peace amongst the chaos? I walk a lot. I exercise a lot, a lot. <laughs> like I'm walking about seven miles a day now and working out as well. And so, and that's necessary. Um, I take solace. If you didn't Go walk ahead. and work out, where do you think you would be? In a Dead. Level? Really? Definitely. Yes. Yes. Definitely. You, is that physically because you wouldn't be physically taking care of your body or because mentally and emotionally your peace would be chaotic and it would drive you to die? That. Wow. Yeah. So that you were saying, sorry, I was interrupting you. Solace, well, and you said, it, peace, that comes to you if you're fortunate. And sometimes it doesn't come. Um, I try to do things that I think are worthwhile, that, that seem worthwhile. And that gives me solace, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so I'm writing, I'm talking to people who I find interesting about things that I think are crucially important. I'm trying to learn and to communicate as a consequence of talking to these people. Um, I'm trying to do what I can for my family and my friends mm -hmm. and to do what I can beyond that as well in a variety of different ways. Um, those are all useful endeavors and they keep me going. What have you found to be the best practices of managing uh, mass attention, whether you want to call it fame, mass attention, mass audience, uh, people being fanatical about your message, your work, you as an individual, 
Uh, well, luckily, that that hasn't happened too much. The fanatical side of things, you know, I've had the odd the odd brush with people who were a little more persistent than was probably good, and you know, I could see lurking signs of mental health issues behind that. And but mm -hmm. fortunately, very little of that has happened, and um, that's certainly all for the good. Because um, you're not you're not living in L.A. That's probably why. <laughs> Well, could be, could be, but it, well, for whatever reason, I've been pretty fortunate about that. Yeah. Um, I talk over what I'm doing with the people around me all the time and try to keep it on the proper pathway to the degree that I'm able to do that and, and to see if what I'm doing is justifiable and ethical. And we're all terrified of this, you know, to a degree that is very difficult to communicate. You know, we, we live in a time where if you make a mistake, you can be shredded. And the, I would say to some degree, the more visible you are, the more thorough the shredding. Oh, right. Yeah. And so the cost of an error, an ethical error, is unbelievably high. The cost of the appearance of an ethical error is extremely high, much less the cost of an actual ethical error. And so we're very careful to try to act ethically in every manner possible appearance and reality mm -hmm. you know everything's being I mean, watched yeah well and I, I i mean i can i i have no idea how any of this looks from the outside but my reputation has been on the line publicly many many times mm -hmm. And partly, sometimes outright accusations, sometimes as a consequence of things I hypothetically said, um, sometimes as a consequence of newspaper articles that, you know, have taken a particular twist. And God only knows how many times a consequence of my own inadequacies and errors. But every time that rises up as an issue, there's a two-week period where no one in my family knows if this is the time that it's just going to go to hell. Really? Where it's all. Oh, crumbles. absolutely. Sure. Do, well, look at how many people it happens to it. Ha and look how people respond, man. You know, it doesn't take a very big Twitter mob to chase anyone back into their hole. How do we chase do a company for that matter back into its on its heels? I mean, isn't that doesn't does that is that how it looks to you? I mean, what what do you think Absolutely. about this? Yeah, I'm just curious. You know, as people, individuals, whether it be me, you, or anyone, wants to build something, wants to have a goal, an aim, as you talk about, and go after this thing that they care about, and share their opinion, share their voice, have good intentions. Maybe someone doesn't like those intentions, but have good intentions. Is how do we, as human beings? think about reputation and does reputation even matter anymore if anyone can try to tear your reputation down should we be focused on having a good reputation yes or, okay. and how do yes, we yes but you should be, you like, should you should be more ethical. focused on deserving a good reputation mm. what does that mean don't don't do things you know to be wrong and even if you don't do, lie yeah don't lie don't be careless you, I mean, especially if you're, see, I'm fortunate, I, I suppose. I put all my lectures online. So virtually everything I've ever said to a student is, I mean, obviously not, but mm -hmm. a non-biased sample of everything that I've ever said to students is available. Well, it hasn't come back to bite me. Right. And that's hundreds of hours. Why? Well, because I've been fortunate enough not to have said anything um, fatal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe that's because I'm careful with my words. Mm -hmm. I don't want to attribute too much virtue to myself in, in, in relationship to that. I know that good fortune plays an immense role in how things turn out for people and that you can get unlucky. But 
you know, one rule I didn't write down is um, act so that you can speak of what you do. So there's two domains of lying, right? So one lie is a statement. The other lie is an action. You know it's wrong. Mm -hmm. You do it anyway. Mm -hmm. It looks to me like that's becoming riskier and riskier. Right. People and, aren't and, doing that anymore because they're getting caught. <laughs> yes. And the consequences are dire. Well, and, but then you think about this. You tell me what you think about this. One of the things that Carl Jung taught me again was that you know, as we become more technologically powerful, the quality of our individual morality becomes an increasingly pressing social concern mm. because of each of us are far more powerful than we were, once were for good and for evil. And so with this technological prowess comes an associated ethical demand. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't see a flaw in that argument. I, I don't see how that can be anything other than true. If technology multiplies your power, then it multiplies the cataclysmic consequences of your own immorality. Right. And if you did one thing 10 years ago and someone finds it, it could haunt you, it seems like, is what's happening. For There's no doubt about that. Not only could it, it will. It will. In all likelihood. You know, and that's a problem, too, because, of course, people do make mistakes. You know, and and... I'm I'm perfectly pleased that my teenage years aren't stored on YouTube, for example. It must <laughs> been, be terrifying. You've been gone a long time ago. <laughs> well, it must be terrifying to be a teenager now, yeah. knowing that your drunken foolishness at a party could become the next viral YouTube video. I mean, yeah, I was lucky enough never to, I've never been drunk uh, in my life. And that was a conscious decision because my, my brother actually went to prison for drugs when I was a kid. And uh, I was in a, prison a visiting room many weekends for many years uh, and witnessing the consequences of doing certain things. So for me, I was like, I don't want to touch any of this stuff. I don't even care if it's like, I'm not going to sell it, but I'm not going to take anything. And um, I, but it doesn't mean that I didn't do bad things. Like, you know, I cheated, I lied, I stole, uh, you know, I did all these things that I'm not proud of when I was 10 to 13 until I, got caught and i was like oh my con my actions actually affect a lot of people and um i remember the, the shame well it's normative behavior i mean if yeah. you look at adolescents imagine there are adolescents who break rules all the time mm -hmm. including criminal including legal rules okay well they tend to become criminal it's mm -hmm. too much but then at the opposite end of the distribution are adolescents who don't break any rules and they tend to develop um in internalizing disorders, depression, anxiety disorders, that sort of thing. So they're too constrained. So there is a, a certain amount of exploration of rule breaking that's a normative part of healthy development. And but but now you know you could take a chunk of that, a video of it, a, a record of it, and it's permanent. Can you imagine not being able to forget your past? <sighs> Painful. You talked about healing the childhood uh, wound, uh, feeling inadequate, feeling insecure, feeling not enough, or all, the, all these feelings on your kind of search or yearning for fame and what does this experience look like, this drive to be more connected to love, to God, to that higher thing. When did you feel in your life the most insecure? And when did you fully start to understand how to overcome your insecurities. Many of these negative emotions and feelings have like a wisdom in them, don't they? Because even like the like the most ferocious forms of chemical dependency that I've experienced, crack and heroin addiction, are kind of about melt in the boundary of who you are look at the idioms around it get off your face get smashed destroy yourself that that on some level again using inappropriate means you are trying to transcend and become free of the self it's a spiritual impulse i may have to talk people through that more slowly because it seems sort of stupid to think of some hunched drunk or junky slumped in a doorway as being on a spiritual quest but when you think that spirituality is simply the 
valorizing of the inner life over the outer life, the need to connect, the need to feel something truthful and real, then anyone that picks up a drink ever or smokes a joint is after a spiritual experience. They're trying to feel better. Man, I felt insecure and worthless a lot of times in my life. It happens to me again and again and again. I'm lucky that I'm an addict because the addiction shows you. It takes you to extremes. So you're confronted with the fallibility of the choices you're making, that, that these choices won't work for you. I think a lot of people, and I wrote about that, you know, in like the recovery book, are able to struggle along with moderate addictions, moderate addictions to food or sex or success or whatever, never ever reaching the point of crisis that would facilitate transformation, metamorphosis, real change, real change. You know that book, Revelation, I was telling you about, and that moment that you talked about going down to that place in Skid Row, the Union Mission, you know. I was doing a craft thing there with my wife. My wife does crafts and uh, writes about craft and, uh, like, creativity and parenting and in mental health and... <laughs> Stuff like that. So we went down there. So I was very much just in an assistant role. The first time I went there, yes, it was to talk to them kids. And I felt like I didn't feel qualified and I didn't feel good enough to do it. I felt somewhat ashamed. I felt ashamed of the, like I think I said in Revelation, like about, you know, if you're talking to homeless kids on some level, like, because this union mission, it's the only one of their missions that takes families. That's what it is. Mm. The others take either men or women or adults or whatever. This one takes whole families. There's a lot of people in there, more than there should be in a, any civilized nation. And like, when I was, when you're there, you want to tell them, look, this isn't your fault. It's not your family's fault. You're a byproduct of a economic system that simply cannot generate. Uh, well, it can generate enough wealth, but it doesn't. It doesn't distribute wealth fairly for, for a number of complex reasons. And you at the arse end of that, you know. And I can't describe, explain that to them. It's patronising and somehow dismissive. And but more importantly, that day that I went to do the craft, I sort of saw, or maybe even someone told me it. Maybe I didn't have this realization. Maybe someone said it to me. They don't know they're poor. They don't, they don't have that contextualization. They're just children. They're just children. And it was sort of beautiful and amazing. And I, since having kids, as I said, I don't do what I used to do a lot. Me, I love children. I've always loved children. I used to get right. And I didn't have kids till like I was 40. So I was very much like if I was around other, my mates, kids or whatever, I'd really play with them and like get into characters with them and do a lot of joyful play. And now I've got kids. I can't be bothered with that. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm not interested, you know. Um, but that day, like I held it down because it was my wife was doing this stuff with the mums and the kids and I felt the heaviness and I felt the shame of the adults and I was um, lifted by the joy of the children. And But I held back, you know, like I was just helping them. They were making Play-Doh together and all this kind of stuff and doing these craft activities. And then when that finished, I let myself off the hook a little bit. I let myself be a dinosaur and a monster and be all crazy with these kids and monkey around with them, you know. And like there was one bit where like all these little five year olds and six year olds and seven year olds, they pulled me to the ground and they was beating me up and stuff. And I sort of looked up for a moment and all I could see, my whole vista was filled with children's faces and they were smiling and they were full of joy. And this is when I felt God is here. God is in this room. Look at this. Isn't There's nothing but joy and love and play and happiness in this lowest of place where people are suffering, poverty, being disregarded, neglected. And the whole room, my whole experience, is filled with love and this is just one moment in time of course I know that those children have got whole lives ahead of them and have whole lives behind them but in that moment there was an absolute realization of something sublime and divine and for me this is an important force of important energy that has to be mobilized valorized brought to the forefront exalted in our culture made the emblem and the driving force and the raison d'etre of the way we live not marginalized neglected to the sidelines so people can plunder the earth and look at the earth as a resource and look at human beings as a resource and fortify systems of elitism if for me the basic idea the sesame street values kindness and love kindness and love instead of the values that, you know that currently dominate selfishness greed right. know, this is what's at play now yeah i love that you talk about sesame street values i'm a i'm a big mr rogers uh, you know, values type of guy myself, which are very similar, I guess, in the fact of just be kind to your neighbor and be loving, be be generous. I'm curious, when have you felt the most loved in your life? And when do you currently feel the most love? Sometimes I think about my wife when I'm not with her. Like, cause when you're with her, she's just a person. But when I'm not with her, <laughs> like, I, 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 I sometimes think, oh my God, I found this person. I found this person that just loves me and doesn't, doesn't care about anything. She's not particularly, you know, I've 
known people that are very impressed by aspects of my nature and behavior uh you know and I, I can speak fast or whatever and say a lot of stuff and i can be novel i don't know my wife she doesn't seem to care about any of that she doesn't she just sort of sees me as i am and i feel very at ease sometimes the greed in me wants stimulation excitement plaudits fanfare the carnival of life but i recognize i have been to that carnival and <laughs> uh, you know, I've had my turn, <laughs> and like it's like it that it doesn't work for me. There's never enough for me. For me, it's the mm. it's the spiritual path. It's the spiritual path, and I think that's true for everyone. But it's not really right for a person that's lived the life I have to be. To, you know, I feel like um spiritual principles are for yourself, not for other people. You know, mm-hmm. uh, like uh, oh oh, these are the things that I must do, and other people have got. A, find their path i suppose and like maybe i can sometimes be helpful to people usually directly in an intimate way hopefully i can be helpful in a broadcast way because indeed that's what we're doing but um who, who knows i'm not sure that i was I, I hope i was helped by you know people talking on the internet or on tv but i can't remember it ever happening <laughs> what is the thing you love about your wife the most my wife She's un. She's strange in a way that you wouldn't straight away notice. She seems because she's she's beautiful, and she's capable and competent, but she's very unusual little person. You know when you're married to someone and you like you know them, you know that after dark they turn into sort of the foulest, most impatient person, or you know, and that they have little ways. What I have in my marriage is a real intimacy, you know, like I have the ability, I don't have to, I can tell, she knows everything. She knows everything about me, you know, and like I, I need a sort of authenticity in, in my connections in life, Lewis, because, uh, uh, yeah, otherwise it's very, very sort of lonely. So uh, what I love about her, I guess, I love her playfulness, her creativity, her willingness to change, her openness to con- uh, to conversation. There's like loads of things that I love about her. She's weird and she's a she's a laugh. She's a, a funny person to hang out with. And that's beautiful. For the for, for the younger audience who it might be confused about their life, their direction, their purpose, their relationships, and they might be chasing something, they might be looking for fame or power or money, whatever they're looking for. What are three things that you would recommend they prioritize? Uh, in their in their chase, in their journey, in their in their life, what are three things that you wish you would have prioritized that you would share with them, so they don't waste their life away or make you know bad mistakes? Live in service of the thing you claim to love. You know, like if you were saying that you want to be an actor, to make sure that what you don't secretly want is actually I just want loads of attention and power and glory and glamour you know like make sure that you are in service of acting or music or whatever it is and that means you know like um, all of us have gifts and we often use these gifts like we put the gift to work like right gift get out there and make me some money (laughs) and make me a star imagine if it was like a little bird or a child or something you have to look after it and take care of it you know me comedy i have always this is the thank god it sort of saved me even before i was switched on sort of spiritually or whatever i and even at my most um keen and needy I always really really loved comedy in a geek way you know I watch a lot of stand-up comedy Mm -hmm. I study sitcoms I learn them I love Monty Python I love Richard Pryor I like you know I know my heritage I know the line that I'm walking I study them study them and observe them so when I was doing stand-up comedy which I was for years and years and years before I made any money out of it at all I was becoming practiced and I was in service of comedy. Of course, I also wanted to be a big famous star and I wanted people to love me and I wanted to have lots of opportunities. Of course I did. But, thank you know, what could I do, man? I had both things. I had both things. Thank God I had both. You know, if all you've got, if all I'd had had been the appetites, the appetites for the plaudits, the prestige and the privilege, I don't know where I would have ended up. So firstly, I'd say be of service to the thing that you claim to love don't think what about what it's going to give you think about what you can give to it okay that's the first one i've got to do three yeah (laughs) if you if you've got three yeah 
The second one is have something away from it like that is not mm. about it. Cultivate your inner life and your spirit. Don't allow it to entirely devour you. The fact is, I think, that we are spiritual beings in essence. We're the only animal that we know of on this planet that have these complex in us these lives of complex inner subjectivity as far as i know my dog doesn't sort of go oh god that was embarrassing you know what i mean like he just is him although he does sometimes look a bit embarrassed thinking about it but like you know, like you know we, we can't spend our life in continual outward pursuit of an external goal because in all likelihood we're pursuing something spiritual anyway without knowing it we're looking for approval or connection mm -hmm. or power or status or whatever it is you can't get that as we, you know, we started off with this thematic idea established by your Carey quote there, mate. So you have to have something that's separate from it. I would suggest meditate, learn how to meditate, mm -hmm. practice meditation, practice meditation, find a form of meditation that works for you. Don't try to change the rules and say something like, I meditate when I'm on the treadmill or I meditate when I'm gardening sit down with your eyes shut and meditate you can have like guided meditation in fact i do guided meditations on my luminary podcast above the noise you could start there or you could do my on my side channel awakening with russell brand on youtube i do guided meditations on there also um but you know god that's don't stop there teach nat han ram das muji all like great great teachers great teachers available everywhere mm -hmm. meditate meditate you have to cultivate your inner life away from it mm -hmm. that's the second one the third one do you want the third yes please you're very lovely aren't you you're very sort of uh. patient and <laughs> <laughs> kind person sincere and sweet um well the third one i would say is make helping other people mm. something that is integral to your life so that you don't get you don't do what I did and become so absorbed in yourself and what you want that mm -hmm. when you get it it doesn't work for you because it was it's meaningless like so like if you if part of your life is helping other people and if you want to go for the black belt in this then help other people without other people finding out about it. Ooh. If you can help people privately and no one knows about it, no one knows about the time you volunteer down at the shelter or the thing you do for a particular person that's in need of it. If you can do that, then what you're cultivating there is a relationship with a, a higher frequency of being. Because of course, kindness or you know virtue now, virtue is itself a commodity. There's not a corporation on earth that isn't putting up some flag or another to ally itself to some cause without actually changing its core behaviours and values, just applying the wallpaper of virtue. If you have some virtuous behaviours that are not advertised, that are not known by anyone but you, you know, next time someone calls you out some little voice in you will go mm -mm, i do mm. that thing nobody right, knows right, about right. that yeah i think it's interesting I, i've always been on the mindset of like show some of the stuff you're doing to help others so that you can inspire other people to be like oh okay that's i should do that too or whether it's a donation or showing up and giving time or some of your resources or talent but definitely you don't need to show it all the time i think it's important to show some to inspire and evoke it and evoke it out of others to be like hey listen I'm doing this thing, you know, you know, I'm in, trying to inspire you to do something in your life that's a cause for you. Um, that's the way I've approached it as well, but I'm, I'm with you on keeping some of it for yourself or not needing to share with others to get, you know, an applause or validation or to be like, you're a good guy or something. Um, yeah, so I, I, love I like that. that, Lewis, because we can create sort of shared values together, like, mm -hmm. you know, by role modeling for one another, you can inspire others and it's not something you can do alone. You know, this idea that sort of it, it like sort of fated or sainted individuals are going to save us doesn't work as well as the idea that collectively we can bring about greatness and change. This infatuation with the individual is sort of part of the problem and I think all of us fall prey to it because it seems so real. What's as real to you as your own thoughts? What's as mm. real to you as your own pleasure? You know, there's legitimate ongoing philosophical debates about whether or not other people are actually even there. You know, the only thing we know for certain is our own existence. So it's easy to fall in that. But if we practice values that appear universal kindness, again, like, you know, the Mr. Rogers or Sesame Street values, then we're sort of part of something transcendent, part of something bigger than us. We're not continually 
furnishing our cell, ornamenting our mm-hmm. fragile and transient egoic structures. What would you say are three skills you wish you would have learned earlier, whether it be a, a tactical skill, the skill of making money, the skill of meditation and managing your emotions, the skill of, you know, um, learning how to connect with people, the skill of speaking on stage. What skills do you wish you would have learned earlier that would have helped you? I wish I'd learned Brazilian (laughs) jiu-jitsu as a child. That would have really grounded me. Yeah. (laughs) Really sort of straightened me out. Why why do you think that would ground you? Because I think it gives you a respect for your body and it gives you a respect Mm. for other people as well. The thing about Brazilian jiu-jitsu is you you learn what you're capable of, but you also see what other people are capable of. So you like think, well, I'm kind of I can do all this stuff, but I oh my god, did look at this guy. <laughs> like I would not have known that. I would not have known from looking at that person that they had those kind of resources. So it it creates the perfect optimal state, I would say, of like I would not want to be a person that's an aggressor or looks to create conflict, but neither am I so anxious about conflict that I'll bend myself into peculiar shapes to avoid it. You know, like, and even, and this is, you know, it's had a positive impact impact on me learning Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in my 40s. So if I'd learned it when I was sort of 12, I think, and also there are affiliated um, values within martial arts, respect, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. hierarchies that are fair and just and earned, uh, camaraderie, physical contact in a in a clear and uh, consensual and boundaried way. I mean, it's just so full of great values. Uh, I mm-hmm. think it's like that martial arts in general, but Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is one I know. Are like um, you know, are like that wonderful communities, and that also also as well. You put aside who you are. You put aside who you are when you enter into it. You know, I do try and use my personality sometimes on the mat. Like, come on, hey, <laughs> I don't charm people a little bit, but it's only moderately successful. Okay, so that's, that's one skill. I wish I'd learned abstinence and the principles of 12-step recovery, which of course mm. encompass quite a lot of values. The principles of recovery, because even before I was a, a, a drug addict, you know, so sort of abstinence-based recovery, I wish I'd learned abstinence-based recovery. Because even before I was addicted to crack and heroin, the way that I was eating chocolate, the way I was watching pornography, the way I was obsessed with girlfriends, the way that I was sort of a clingy little dude, you know, like all of these things, the idea that... I can have a connection to a God of my own understanding that I can be to a degree sufficient, that I am I am not God. I'm not the most important person in the world all the time, but also I'm not scum. I like um I don't have to bow and scrape before anybody. I have values, but I don't need to always, as they say in the some of the great literature, uh, scrambling to be on the top of the pile or hiding underneath it. You know, like being happy to be just a person among people, not always seeking to sort of somehow either fate, isolate or separate myself. You know, being happy to be part of a community or part of a group or part of a family. The 12 step recovery has so many beautiful principles. The idea of God and the idea that we all have equal access to God. The idea of fellowship, fraternity, sorority, brotherhood and sisterhood between us. The idea of service of one another. The idea of being honest and authentic about who we are. Surrender, acceptance. So I would say the skills of 12 step recovery. Yes, that would be Mm -hmm. the second one. Okay. The third one would be another thing i mean i really sometimes like every day i think about i, I wish i spoke another language i every day i think gosh it. man so it's I, funny to say that because for 20 years russell i've been at the end of every year i look back and say okay what am i proud of that i created and and what do i regret that i didn't do that i wish i would have done every year for 20 years has been i wish i would have learned spanish hmm. and spanish is the one i want and for because and every year I try. Every year I'm like, okay, I'm going to download the latest app. Download gonna, the app. I'm going to get the book. I'm going to try this new pro- Someone said, this is the program that'll work for you. You'll be fluent in three months, all this stuff. And it gets so hard for my brain within the first few days. And I'm like, I'm just not smart enough. I can't figure this out. It hurts. I've got all these other things going on. And I end up giving up on myself. And every year- The last year, one I did. 
Yeah. Sorry, which, to which one? Which one? Which app did you try? I'm just trying to find it. Like I really got quite far in. I was pretty pleased with myself. I was this doing is a, well. Is this Babel? Is this, yeah. Babel. Yeah, I was doing well, and then it got into this sort of this area of grammar that was so complex. <laughs> this is the same as saying this. I was like, "What? That's so hard. I can't even. I can't find an equivalent for that in English." And I don't. You look. If you've been doing this for twenty years, you must be the same as me. You must be like, you know, that you're gonna have to go somewhere where you've got no choice. You've got to go to Argentina or Cuba or Madrid or whatever, <laughs> and then fully get down with it because well, yeah. otherwise, exactly. Well, here's the thing. What I've realized is I kept losing integrity with myself because I kept wanting to do it. I kept saying I was going to do it. And then every year I wouldn't do it. And I kept feeling like less and less confident with myself. And so I either needed to kill the dream and say, I no longer care about this dream and let it go and say, that's not for me in my life. Or I needed to commit to it. And six months ago, I said, I'm hiring a tutor three days a week. I'm making scheduling the time in the calendar. I'm going to make it a commitment. And the first four months were miserable. It was, I didn't feel like I was learning a thing, but now I'm on six, I feel like I'm still not good, but I'm like, it doesn't hurt my brain as much. And I could see, okay, you know, in, in three, five, seven years, I could become a lot better. I could have a conversation and, and, and feel proud of it. And it's tough. I get up at, you know, I do it at 8 a.m.s and um, sessions, but it's like, I don't want to feel you know, not confident and proud of myself by wanting this thing and always putting it off. So well yeah, I done. think it's either a full immersion or finding a tutor and just saying, okay, three days a week or five days a week, I'm doing this and sacrificing something else. But it's, it's been, it's been powerful for me. I don't know if you're similar to this. When I take something on, I want to be the best at it within a day. I want it to be great. I want to do things that I'm good at. And this is something that humbles me. It's like being in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for the first time, probably. Yeah. It's like uh, I'm on my back getting pinned every moment, no matter what maneuver I try to do. And uh, you just got to say, okay, I'm here to learn. Uh, you know, I know nothing and have a beginner's mind. So <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a humbling yet powerful experience because I haven't been able to use the skill, but I know it's helping me learn and connecting the dots on things. And it's just, uh, I feel proud even if I never use it, just because I've been doing it and it's something I want to do, so. What would you say would be the, the keys to your success of 50 years of loving each other and being in a what seems to be a healthy, functional relationship when in society today, there doesn't seem like many of those? Well, we, we really do our best not to lie to each other about anything. And we also have fights when they're necessary. We don't let things, we don't hide things in the fog. That's the title of chapter three of my new book, Don't Hide Things in the Fog. And we work through our issues. Our, if, we're, if we have a dispute, we do our level best to get to the bottom of it, to find out what in the world's causing it, who's needs to change and why and how and when, and then how we can progress forward into the future without having that issue dog us or drag behind us or interfere with us at all. And that means a fair bit of confrontation, I would say, but in less so over the years as we've settled more and more things, but everything's out in the open. Everything that we can get is out, of, out in the open. You, you can't have a relationship without trust mm. and you, you trust your partner courageously. If you're not naive, knowing that you can be hurt and that you can be deceived and that you can also do both of those things. So you offer your partner, your trust as an invitation to them to be honest and forthcoming and, and well, and then issues come up and you delve into them and straighten them out. And we also attend to the relationship um, in, I'm not going to refer back to this new book continually, but it's relevant <laughs> in this context. Um, it's chapter 10, plan and work diligently to maintain the romance in your relationship. And we do that as well. And it is effortful. Mm. I mean, we, we try to have throughout our relationship, we've tried to have romantic dates one to three times a week and they require preparation and cooperation and 
the will to do it and the will to put yourself on the line and the, the desire to make that a priority, even when other things are more pressing. Um, we both want it to work. That's another thing. We're committed to it mm -hmm. um, and not interested in finding another relationship. And so far, we've been fortunate and that's worked. Um, we have fun together. We love our kids. We have had joint projects of all sorts together, renovating houses, traveling, raising our children, now our grandchildren. Um, but of all of that is the, the most important thing, as far as I'm concerned, is to not to lie to your partner. You mentioned you don't have a relationship if you don't have trust or if there's not trust in the relationship. How does someone, um, if someone is not trusting the other partner, how do you cultivate trust if you're 100% honest with that person, if you are transparent about every action you make in your life, if you're, you know, they have access to whatever they want to see and you're, you're constantly creating trust, but for whatever reason, they still might be jealous or insecure or not believing you. How does someone get someone to trust them? Or is it not about them at that stage and it's about the other person and their insecurities? Well, it, it depends very much on the particulars of the situation. Um, you know, so I don't know if there's a generic answer to that. I think that you can establish the ground rules explicitly, you know, and have a discussion about it. Are we going to lie to each other or not? Are we going to tell each other the truth to the degree that we can to make that an actual goal and to talk through the consequences of doing that and not doing it. And then I would also say, whenever a hiccup occurs in the relationship, maybe you don't call it out at each hiccup, you know, because you have to have a certain amount of silent tolerance in any relationship to let small infractions go. But if they repeat, my rule is three times. And it's the rule that we I share with my wife. If something happens three times that is causing emotional upset, anger, jealousy, disappointment, resentment, frustration, any of those things, anything that you don't want to experience and that you especially don't want to experience repeatedly, then you can call it out. And and if you if you have three examples, your case is much better made than if you just have one. And I would also say that when you call it out, you know, you could say, look, uh, we were at a party the other night and you were, it looked to me, I felt as if you were paying too much intense intent attention to um, Dave. Mm -hmm. There was some flirting going on there. That's what it looked like to me. There was some flirting going on there. And, you know, I, that made me uncomfortable. Well, you don't say, well, you were flirting, stop doing it. You say, well, this is how it looked. This is what it looked like to me. And here was my response. And then you want to think, and maybe I'm a damn fool and blind and jealous and stupid. And I'm misinterpreting, or maybe it was a harmless flirtation of the sort that people will engage in because it adds a little bit of spice to a social interaction. You want to find out like it, it's really convenient if it's the other person's fault, except then you're laden with living with that person. So it really doesn't help you anyways, but it's convenient because then they have to change. But mm -hmm. you've got to think about this over the long run. You're going to be interacting with this person on a minute by minute basis for decades. Um, if you're the idiot and that's causing trouble, then you should find out. So you want to say, well, look, this is what I saw what's your explanation of what's going on? Mm. And then they'll offer you their viewpoint and hopefully they'll do the same thing. They'll think, well, this is my intent and maybe they have to go think about it, but this is my intent and this is what I saw. And I think you're being oversensitive um, in that situation. And you peel back the explanations layer by layer until you both agree on what happened and more importantly, on what you're going to do about it in the future. And that's really hard. And especially if there is something going on that's not straight, mm -hmm. because that will require quite a bit of digging. It'll probably result in anger and tears and a fight. And that's very unpleasant. It's, it's easier in the short term to avoid that. 
But hopefully the consequence of that is you don't have to have that fight again. Right. You have to come to a negotiated agreement about, about that situation. And you have to pay attention to your own uncomfortable negative emotions in order to manage that and not and not pretend that everything's all right or that you're nicer than you are or that you're less jealous than you are or 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 less blind or see one of the things i learned from carl jung the psychoanalyst about marriage was that there is a reason marriage was a vow like the vow is that you stick together okay so now imagine that's a vow Okay, you do not get to leave, period. <laughs> okay, so what does that mean? Well, on the upside, it means that you don't have to be alone. It means that your family will have continuity over decades. It means that the narrative of your life won't be fragmented and broken by divorce or sequential divorce. It means that your children can grow up and maybe have their children within a continuing family. Um, it means that your children will be able to maintain relationships with the grandparents on both sides and the cousins. Like it's a big deal to maintain that. There's huge advantages in it. It means that you'll have someone there when you're not well and so will your partner. Um, and it'll mean that you have someone to share all of the positive things of life with. So there's huge advantages to it. Okay, so why does it have to be a vow? Well, I don't think you can tell the truth to someone who can run away, because if you tell the truth to someone and they can run away, then they'll run away. Right. Right? Because you're, you're a mess, man. And not, not just because of your own inadequacies, but because human beings are so complicated and, and have such dark corners and, and, and have had, you know, unresolved problems in their life sometimes that stem back generations and mm. are twisted and bent in all sorts of ways. And you, you can't, re it's very, very difficult to reveal that except to someone who can't run away. Now that, that, you know, I'm not saying that people should never separate. I, I am saying though, that it's better not to, mm. if you can manage it. But then the other thing, too, is if you can't run away, then you're motivated in a different way. It's like, I'm stuck with this woman, and she's stuck with me. And unless we want to have this same goddamn fight over and over and over for the next who knows how long, why don't we straighten it out? And then we can put it behind us. See, the, the vow gives you a kind of desperation mm. that is another motivation to actually solve the problems. And if you've got a way out, you, you can always stay hidden. You can guard yourself. You can protect yourself and even protect that part of yourself that thinks that it can leave if things get too bad. Now, the problem with that, in my estimation, is, is that you're going to drag your stupidity into the next relationship. <laughs> right. Always do, right? Well, generally speaking, right? And so now you can get very, you can, you can, in, under unfortunate circumstances, you can get tangled up with someone who's not playing a straight game with you and won't, and, and it's just impossible. But I'm not talking about the limit cases, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the average case, the mm -hmm. average amount of unhappiness and trouble. It's still plenty. And it, then the uh, sorry, just one more thing ahead. I'd add yeah, to yeah. that. You also have to, sh in some sense, shake the illusion that the other person is somehow not you. You're so tied up with them that mm. there's no difference between you and them in some sense, is that what's good for her is going to be good for you and vice versa. One of the things we try to do too, the two of us is we try to say yes to each other. Now, there's rules that go along with that, which is, well, I'm going to say yes to you, but that sort of means that you shouldn't ask me unreasonable, you shouldn't make unreasonable demands. I'll say yes as much as I possibly can, and then you'll do that in re return, and then we get yes out of the deal instead of no. Um, that's also a huge plus. Um, yeah. So that's that's...
Is there anything else about you? You want you want to you want you have to want the best for the other person mm. and you and for the relationship, and, and in you, within that confine, you want to tell each other the truth. Yeah, the truth is is huge. And I heard you mention jealousy and insecurity at, at, at some point. That that message is there room for jealousy and insecurity in a relationship? Is there a healthy amount of jealousy that people should have in a relationship? Or does jealousy and insecurity only cause more suffering and pain in a relationship? Well, I think there's a reasonable amount of proprietary interest, let's say. I mean, in a, in a classic monogamous relationship, a marriage, there's sexual fidelity as a crucial element of that. Um, and maybe you'll make an arrangement that differs from that, but it's not easy to chart uncharted territory like that. I mean, mm -hmm. if you want to have an adventure like that with a partner, a monogamous adventure that also includes sexual exploration, well, maybe you can pull it off, but I doubt it. It's really complicated. Yeah. Let's say you're not having sexual exploration with other people and you're telling each other the truth and you're being honest. Is there room to be jealous or insecure uh, in that relationship? Or it does, does jealousy typically cause more harm than it does, you know, spice and good, I guess. I think jealousy probably causes more trouble than good, but that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the proprietary interest. Mm -hmm. Should you care if your partner pays undue attention to someone of the opposite sex they find attractive? Well, probably you should care. You might even say something about it. They might even be happy about that, mm. right? Because it indicates that you noticed and that it matters to you. Now, I think it shades into jealousy when it's harmless interactions, it's interactions that would be regarded as harmless by a third party observer, let's say. Mm -hmm. I know that's a very difficult line to draw, that are being magnified as a consequence of insecurity on the part of the observer. Or there's envy where your partner is attracting attention, mm. status, success, any of those things, and you're jealous of that. That's not helpful. You should be. Pleased. The optimal situation is for you to be pleased when your partner is successful. Mm. Um, I, I don't think competitive couples, I don't think competition between people who are in a monogamous relationship is useful, particularly. It's not zero sum competition. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can d compete in a game like sense. Right. Fun, you know, like, fun playful competition, but not. I'm yeah, but not, life. not existential <laughs> competition. You're on the same team. That's the point. Right. You know, and if one of you is feeling left behind for one reason or another, it's it's time to throw that out on the table and say, look, I'm I'm playing second fiddle here far too often. What can we do about that? Well, it looks like you need it. And like, I've got an adventure. It looks like you need one too. Well, how can we rearrange the situation so I have my adventure? And then it's up to that person, too, to figure out what obstacles they might be putting up in their own pathway, yeah. right, that's stopping them. And then they have, you know, they're angry at you for getting in the way, but it's actually a consequence of them using you as a convenient excuse for not doing something difficult. Those things all have to be sorted through. It's very hard. Yeah. Like, these conversations are extremely difficult. It's no wonder people avoid them. I also think people are not taught to negotiate. Oh man. At all. They they and that's a that's a real shame. First of all, you figure out what you want. This is what I want. Then you tell the person, then you strategize with them so that you can get what you want and they can get what they want and you both know what that is and away you go together. And that that usually comes out it's usually obscured and hidden and, and comes out awkwardly and difficulty and, and with difficulty if it comes out at all. And people fool themselves into thinking that it's okay what they're doing. I'm sacrificing myself for the children and that's okay. I'm mm -hmm. sacrificing myself for um, my husband's career and that's okay. Um, I'm working at a job I can't stand because I need to support my wife and children and that's okay. I mean, sometimes that is okay, but it has to be 
out clear in the open, talked about, negotiated, discussed. Uh, you know, I think there's you can be a slave or a tyrant or you can negotiate. Mm -hmm. Those are your options. Mm -hmm. And we default to slavery and tyranny because that doesn't require any cognitive effort. Mm. And then we pretend that everything's all right. And then it blows up in our faces and we end up divorced. Right. So we got to learn how to negotiate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then you have to notice that there are things that you want, right? And you have to tell yourself what those are. And then you have to let the other person know. And then they can deprive you of them because they actually know who you are. And so that's a big risk. Mm. But uh, if you, uh, yeah. if well, if you if you do lay 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 it out and negotiate it, then you have two people working in the same direction, and they each bring their different viewpoints to bear on the problem. And sometimes that'll save you, you know, that additional cognitive complexity you have because there's two of you instead of one. Mm -hmm. It can make you much more effective. What happens when we feel like our partner? is depriving us of what we want if it's not, you know, uh, infidelity or something of the, the likes of being with other people, but something else that we want in our life, uh, a goal. Well, a sexually, dream. that happens all the time. Right. Because people, generally speaking, men would like to have sex more frequently than women. So that's a, that's a sticking point in many relationships. Um, but forget that for the moment, we might just as well say that the probability that one partner and the other partner are going to have exactly the same level of sexual interest, say with regards to frequency is quite low. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be friction there. So what do you do? Well, you, you, you negotiate about it. It's like, well, I'd like to have sex 15 times a week. <laughs> well, I'd like to have sex once a week. Right. Okay, well, you know, the logical, the logical uh, meeting point there would be in the middle. Mm -hmm. But then that has to be planned out. And you also have to say exactly what you mean. Well, exactly what do you mean by sex? Do you, do, because there's all sorts of variations of sex, include, include, from ranging from just intimate closeness to... Mm -hmm full-fledged sexual activity of various sorts and the various sorts matter too. And these are painful discussions often. It's very funny in some sense that people will do and desire things that they won't talk about, hmm. right? They're, they're, they'll, they'll engage in the act, but they won't engage in the negotiation and they won't admit what they want. Why is it so hard for us to admit what we want? We're ashamed of it. Mm. That's easy with sex. Uh, sex and sh sh shame regulates sex. Mm. You know, people say, well, you shouldn't be ashamed of sex. It's like, well, really? Really? No, that's a stupid theory. Mm. We arrest people who expose themselves in public. Why? Well, because we don't want people masturbating in public. We assume they should be ashamed enough not to do that. Mm. Shame regulates sexual behavior. So we're embarrassed about our desires. And, you know, naively you'd think, well, you can just shed that. Well, first of all, no, you can't. And second of all, it isn't obvious at all that you should. Mm. What you might be able to do is to determine how to play out your sexual life in the confines of your relationship in a manner that neither of you do find shameful. But that's, a, that's a, just think how hard that is. Like, you know, you think, well, that's what I want. It's like, but then you think about how unlikely that is and how difficult it would be to attain it. Before we continue this video, make sure to subscribe below and turn on the notification bell right now so you don't miss out on these great videos every single day. I think that you mentioned at one point is like, putting ourselves in um, structured pain, like structured mm -hmm. sense of feeling pain throughout the day, whether it be the tough conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that, it's painful, but I'm going to because I know afterwards mm -hmm. 
it's going to probably feel better. Mm -hmm. It's a bit There'll of a sacrifice, yeah. right? So you As sacrifice yeah. stability in the present for a gain in the future. That's the big discovery of human beings. And, and were you sacrifice big, works. Exactly. And were you a big athlete growing up? No. No? But no. A, well, I was a, lo a small kid, and I right, skipped right. a grade. Yeah. Although I skied, and I went cross-country skiing. That's and that, good. It's individual sports yeah. things, mostly with my dad. You understand, then, in order to improve as an athlete or in any sport, mm -hmm. you have to put yourself through daily pain. Yeah, right. If you want to achieve that model of excellence that you watch someone play playing basketball mm. as a child and you see someone living this model, it's going to be 15 years of deliberate pain. Yeah, that's a discipline. That's man. it. Yeah, well, I worked out for a long time with weights, you know. And, so you know. You yeah, felt yeah, it every yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, you didn't yeah. want to push through the pain, but yeah. you knew that it would get you a greater result. Yeah, well, and it's easier not to do it than to do it, but not easier. in the long run. Yeah, exactly. You know, I've really seen the benefits, for example, for weightlifting, because I've watched mm -hmm. people, because I'm 58, 50, how old am I? 56. You look great. You no, know, I'm, so I'm getting older, and I've really noticed the difference between people and when they age. Um, between people who laid down a good physiological platform when they were young and those who didn't because by the if you haven't worked out weights particularly yeah. I would say you start to get pretty soft in your 30s and your cardiovascular system starts to go and really early the other thing too is the best thing you can do to maintain cognitive uh, ability isn't to do exercises like lumosity it's not brain exercises mm. that keep you sharp it's exercise so if Physical. you're 50, both yeah. cardiovascular and weightlifting, if you're 50, you can restore your cognitive function to the level of a 30-year-old through exercise. Your, your mental function mm -hmm. through physical activity. Yeah, well, your brain is a very demanding organ. And if your cardiovascular system is compromised, then you get stupid. And wow. so, yeah, it's really... So the less I, I, you move and the bigger mm -hmm. you get, the more stupid you become. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the because you, com you, well, you compromise, you compromise its function. Because the brain is, it, it, it's, it's, it's the organ that uses more, it's, it's very metabolically demanding. And so if you're not in phys good physical shape, then the, one of the things that suffers most greatly is your cognitive function. And so mm -hmm. that's quite an interesting thing to see how tight that linkage is. So in the next part yeah. of the program, we have people, now it's okay, now you've got your vision. Yeah. Even if it's a bad one, it's yeah, still okay. That's right. Well, it's better than no vision at all, right? It's better something no that you land. can improve. Yeah. Well, think, you're trying to get through a territory you don't understand. And here's your option. No map, a map that's not so good but has some <laughs> things about it, or a great map. Well, right. obviously the great map is the thing you I want, do, yeah. but the, the map that's something is way better than the map that's nothing. Plus, as you explore, because of your map, you could start to fill in the details. And you start to learn, and you start mm -hmm. to overcome <clears throat> stuff, and you mm -hmm. start to master skills mm -hmm. on your journey, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's the other thing, too, is like, let's say you, you aim at something and you and you develop some skills along the way, and then you get like a third of the way there, and you think, oh, that's not for me. It's like, well, yeah, fair enough, but now you've still got the skills you developed. You know exactly why it's not for you now, instead of vaguely. So you don't have to keep going after that exactly, way. Exactly, exactly. Well, and you have a rationale, yeah. and then you can bring that wisdom back, even though it's not perfect, you can bring it back to your next plan. And so- And take responsibility yes. for the next steps. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so yeah. as you plan, you get better at planning, which is the crucial thing. So, so then we say to people, well, take your positive vision and make it into eight stateable goals, right? So, and then rank them in a hierarchy because you need to know what- Like a top goal and yeah, then yeah, and, incremental goals. Yeah, and, and, and that, well, that's the other thing is break the goals into incremental goals so that you have a reasonable probability of succeeding. So, because what you want to do, this is also what you want to do with a kid. You don't tell your kid, here's an impossible thing. Why don't you go out and fail? You say, here's something worth going after. Here's a step you could take that would push you beyond where you are, but that you also have a reasonably high probability of succeeding at, mm -hmm. right? They call that- Within the, a time frame. Mm, yeah, within yeah. some time frame. That's the other thing. You have to parameterize it with regards to time frame. That's right. And that puts you in the zone of proximal development. And that's a, that's a concept that was generated by a guy named Vygotsky. He was a Russian developmental psychologist and a smart one. It's where the idea of the zone comes from, mm, to be in the zone. Yes. And when you're in the zone, you're expanding your skills at, in a manner that's intrinsically rewarding because you're succeeding. And so you want to set, if you're good to yourself, you think, okay, I need to set a goal, but I need to set a goal that someone as stupid and useless as me could probably attain if they put some effort into it. Right. And then, you got, then you've got it perfectly because it's not so high that it's grandiose or impossible that you fail necessarily and then justify your bitterness. It's like, well, I could do, well, because that, that happens to people. <laughs> happens man. all the time. Yeah, it's like. I see this all the time. You know, it's like, 
It's yes, exactly. Well, I set a goal and I didn't attain it, so I'm not going to set any more goals. Right. It's like, no, you set a goal that was inappropriate. For the you, time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. You didn't calibrate it properly. Yeah. And, and you're playing a trick on yourself because you wanted to fail so that you could justify not having to try. So, and being a victim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which isn't helpful. You're still going to be a victim. It's yeah. like, there's no way out of that, man. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, because life is, this, life is a challenge that in some sense can't be surmounted. So there's no way out of your problem. But there are certainly proper ways of dealing with it. Yeah. And so you so lay you those out eight, those eight steps. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Lay them out. And then the next thing is, OK, you need a rationale for them because you're going to have doubts and other gonna, people are going to put up obstacles. Is that so a you meaning to, you mean? Is that hmm? a meaning? A rationale means a meaning? Yeah. Yeah. A justification. Yeah. It's like, OK, so here, what sort of justification is a good justification for your goals? It's easy. Why would it be good for you? OK. Why would it be good for your family if you attained that goal? Why would it be good for the broader community? Because if it's a good goal, it should be good for you. That's fine. But if it's a really good goal, it should be good for you in a way that's good for other people. Win, win, win. Yes, exactly. And, you, and if you're going to decide what your goals are, why not set up the ones that benefit the largest number of the people maximum. simultaneously. Yeah. Yes, and if you can do that, you should start with your own concerns because you have yeah. to take care of yourself. Basic needs first. Yes, put your own Family. oxygen mask on, then put your child's oxygen Community. mask on. Yeah, right. And then you can, as you as you build up a, the basis of competence locally, you might develop enough skills so that you can expand that outward. Mm. And it also gives your goal a certain amount of nobility. And so, and if someone challenges yeah. you and says, "Well, why are you doing that?" That seems stupid. You can say, I'm doing that because it helps me take care of myself, but it benefits my family, and here's the reasons why. And this is the repercussions out into the broader community. And like people aren't people who are putting up objections and doubts aren't aren't armed to deal with that kind of response. Yeah. And then when you have those doubts in your mind that plague you, which they and you go back to your reasons. You go back to your reasons, you <clears throat> your say why. That's right. Say why why am I doing this? Oh yeah, it's because well I have to take care of myself because otherwise I'm pathetic and useless and bitter <laughs> and cruel and then and I'm going somewhere terrible, so that's a bad idea. And here's how it would help my family and here's how it would help the community, and that's a good enough set of reasons for unless I can think of better ones. Right. Right. If without better ones, that's good enough. Because I think the question <clears throat> comes back to after, you know, Someone could go down the rabbit hole and say, why, why am I doing this? And why is this, you know, meaningful for me? And I think a lot of people go back to, well, why am I here in the first yes. place? Yes, yes. Why am I here? Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of my life? Mm -hmm. And is this real? Mm -hmm. Or is this just some dream world? Well, and then and that, and people do go back to that. And then they get stuck on that. Yeah. What, but, but none of this even matters because... Why am I even here? Well, the, the thing is, is that that's a self-defeating set of propositions yeah. in some right. sense, because the consequence of being stuck there, no the reason you're again. stuck there to begin with is because you're not very happy about the fact that life is intrinsically tied up with suffering, because mm -hmm. you wouldn't be asking that question to begin with. Okay, so if you let that pull you in and take you down, all it does is make the suffering worse. Absolutely. It's not helpful. And then, and then the cascade that we talked about happens. You suffer stupidly and pointlessly. You, you get bitter. <clears throat> you get cruel. Yeah. You make everything worse. It's like, that's your answer, is it? You're going to make everything worse. It's bad enough. You're going to make it worse. <laughs> Mostly people won't do that consciously. Yes. So you think, well, what's the alternative? Well, here's one. If you have a sufficiently noble purpose, the suffering will justify itself. And I think, I think that's empirically testable. And I do believe it's the case because I've watched people do very difficult things like people who work in palliative care wards. So all they're ever dealing with is pain and death, right? And they can do it. They get up in the morning, they go to work and they take care of those people. They lose people on a weekly basis and yet they can do it. And what that shows is that if you turn around and you confront the suffering voluntarily, you find out that you are way tougher than you think. It's not that life is better than you think. Life is as harsh as you think. It might even be worse, but you are way tougher than you think if you turn around and confront it. And so then what you discover is that there's a spirit within you that, pursues, that can pursue something meaningful, that has the resilience and the strength to contend properly with the catastrophe of existence without becoming bitter. That's actually the central. So, mm. and, and I would say that's one of the central themes of 12 Rules for Life is that right. make no mistake about it. Like, the first noble truth of Buddhism, life is suffering. This is true. And it's worse than that because it's suffering contaminated by malevolence. That's the baseline. But, and so that's very pessimistic. But the optimistic part is that you are so damn tough, you can actually not only deal with that, you can improve it. Mm. It's like, hmm, oh, well, that's a horrible situation. 
but it turns out that I'm armed for the task. Well, that's, that's a great thing for people to know. And I do believe, I think the fact that we're armed for the task is even more true than the fact that life is catastrophe contaminated by malevolence. We're stronger than things are terrible. So, and things are pretty terrible. So that means we're pretty damn strong. <laughs> wow. Yes, it's a very good thing to know. And it's not naive optimism. Yeah. It's a very different thing. It's like, no, things are terrible. They're brutal. And you are so damn tough, you can't believe it. What's been the biggest challenge in your life that you've had to overcome? Or the biggest suffering that took you the longest to get beyond to improve? Oh, I think that was probably, and I wrote about this in the last chapter of my book, which is called Pet a Cat When You Encounter One in the Street. And it's about, mm -hmm. it's about dealing with, you know, you think, well, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? Well, I think the worst thing is that you do something really horrible and you screw up your life and everyone's life around you. That's that's and you have bad. to live with it. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. you have to live with knowing you did it. It's like, that's rough, man. That's sin. It's worse so than to dying. Speak. Yes. Because then you don't remember. Mm -hmm. or, you mm -hmm. know, right, know, right. Remember it. There are worse things Suffering's than over. dying. Yeah, there are. Yes, there are. No, <laughs> no, no. That's, that's a bad, that bad thing, man. But <laughs> but I think the the hardest existential situation that I've been in is the situation with my daughter because she was very, very ill. Mm -hmm. And she had rheumatoid arthritis. She had arthritis, it wasn't rheumatoid type. And she had 40 affected joints. That had started to bother her when she was two, mm. but it really manifested itself fully when she was six. And some of the medical treatment helped, but when she was 15, 14, 14 through 16, um, first her hip disintegrated, Ugh. and then her, and so she had that replaced after walking around on it for like a oh, good man. year, and then her ankle disintegrated on her other foot, and she had to have it replaced. And so there were two years of absolutely brutal pain for her, like brutal, daily, excruciating pain. And, and we were really running around trying to figure out what to do about it, because the hip wasn't too hard to replace, you know, because surgeons are actually pretty good at hip replacements, right. ankle. but ankles are still so many bones touch and, and go. Yeah. Yeah, and so, and just watching that and, 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 well, watching what it was doing to her because she was in enough pain, it, at one point it just about broke her, you know. And I mean, you know, you and I, you've probably been in a situation yeah. where you were in pain for a night and couldn't sleep. It's like, yeah, fine, mm -hmm. so multiply that by five and extend it over two years. You think, That's tough. Jesus Christ, yeah, and she was on like huge doses of opiates and so that was sedating her and oh, so that man. made her look drunk in public and she can only stay awake for about six hours a day and she had to take Ritalin to stay awake because otherwise she was just sleeping all the time and, and it was a very bad autoimmune condition and so it wasn't only manifest in, in the jo joint deterioration and the pain because arthritis is also very painful and 40 joints happens to be quite a lot. Oh yeah, just so one joint. It was brutal, one. yeah, right. Yeah. No, it was absolutely, Brutal beyond belief. As a father so, or a parent, how do you navigate that emotionally yourself? Yeah, well, that's what that chapter is about. I mean, so, so what do you do when, when things are too much? Well, one of the answers is you narrow your time frame. And the other answer is you look for occasions of grace and beauty where you can mm. get them. So Any when she moments. had a dog, that really helped. Yeah. You know, so that was something that was with her all the time. And we tried to put things in her life that, that she, she could care for. She had a whole raft of pets, although she was allergic to almost everything. So most of them were lizards. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. We'd get her a guinea a pig. Here's puppy. a guinea pig. It's like, oh, I love this guinea pig. It's such I'm a in pain. And then, you know, three hours later, she'd have a big rash. Oh, and we'd no. have to take the guinea pig back oh. <laughs> to the pet like, store. You're like a hairless Jesus dog or something. Christ. Yeah. So the dog, luckily, the dog she could tolerate. And so oh, we had the gosh. dog for her. And, but what one of the things you do when you're in a situation like that, and it's just a bloody ongoing nightmare, is that you you shrink your time frame. It's like, well, what are we going to do in a year? It's like, oh God, we can't even think about that. Think about tomorrow, Six months, or no, a week, three yeah. months, yeah, a week, tomorrow, wow. today, the next hour. Yeah, so that's what you, you have really to do. Shrink your time. You shrink you you shrink your time frame till you can tolerate it. So you're not planning out years because then you'll go crazy. Yeah, it's too much uncertainty. Morning, yeah. Yeah, you think, okay, how can I make the next hour the least amount of awful possible? That's what you do at someone's deathbed. Right. You know, you shrink your time frame, and that and that's what you have to do. How does that play into the uh, 
the self-authoring program if you have this vision for yourself and you're mapping out a year, two, three, five years ahead. Yeah, well, sometimes, you know. You have to re-navigate. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. You have to re-navigate. You have to say no. fit it into that time. Yeah, because even the best laid plans of mice and men go astray. You know, I mean, that's part of being alive. And so you have your map. But, you know, if you get a flat tire along the way, you still have to stop and fix your car. Well, Maybe the bloody thing bursts into flames and you have to get a new <laughs> car. Right. You know, so, I mean. Your, your, your ascent towards your goals can be punctuated by unexpected catastrophe. And then, well, then hopefully you've made yourself into a resilient person at that point. And the catastrophe is no worse than it has to be. And you're not making it worse. I mean, one of the things we were fortunate about is that by the time she got really ill, my, my relationship with my wife was pretty well put together. And my relationship with my son, my, my, who's younger than her, was also well put together. And so he was an absolute trooper, man, mm. because most of, for a lot of his teenage life in particular, there was a huge amount of focus on the suffering of his sister. And we were like right up to here with that. It was just, it was enough. And he conducted himself admirably. Wow. He didn't, if he caused trouble, we didn't know about it kept it to himself, you know, and I don't mean he was hiding, I mean he dealt with it. Right. And he spent a lot of time at home, and he didn't do any unnecessarily stupid things, and he put up with his sister and his parents who were on edge a lot, without adding additional catastrophe and misery and grief to it. And when she was a little bit crazy and was leaning on him too hard or bothering him, he was there to support her, and wow. it was massively helpful. And, you know, I wasn't any more, my wife and I weren't any more crazy towards each other than we had to be. And so there wasn't like any additional stress during that's those good. periods of time that sunk us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any so, extra would have been like, <clears throat> yeah, it was I'm just done. Too, that's right. That's right. How are you able to compartmentalize or just focus on your, your career at that time? You know, lecturing or writing or whatever it may be at that well, time. Well, that's also part of the vision of hell. It's like, well, what's the alternative? You let things go and you make them worse. It's like not showing up and mm, yeah, just no, no. There's worse. no excuse for that. It's like you so can't. How did you? How did you say? Was there a com compartmentalizing of like, okay, it's nine o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning. I'm going to work. Yeah, and then after yeah. Well, we rest. made rules and we talked yeah. about some of them. Like some of the rules were uh, we didn't talk about my daughter daughter's illness after eight o'clock at night. That was the rule. It's like for no your sanity. Well, yeah. we it's a, it's a war. You wear yourself out in a week, you're dead, and, and everyone suffers a lot. So you've got to keep going through however long this is going to be. And so wow. what, you, what do you have to do? Well, you have to sleep. You have to sleep you or to things are going to go bad. You, you, yeah, yeah, that's are right. It's time to stop more? talking and go to sleep. That's, yeah, you had so you have to cut off. Yeah, well, and I had learned some of that because I've been a clinical psychologist for a long time. And so wow. I've been dealing with people's problems. And you learn how to, you know, you think, well, how can you go home when, when you have all of those problems to contend with? It's like, well, A... They're not your problems. They're not right? going away right no, now. No, and they're not going away. And, and having them bring you down is not helping the person who has the problem. It's the same with, with my daughter. It's like had my wife and I deteriorated as a consequence of her condition, A, that would have been horrible for her because then she would have had to bear the weight of watching her illness destroy her family, right? right? Which and have is, that guilt. Oh, shame. Christ, yes. I mean, that's one of the <clears> terrible <throat> things about having a, a very bad illness is that not only does it do you in, but you can see it taking its toll on the people around you. I think that mm -hmm. might even be worse. I mean, this is gradations of hell, but still that's, so you also can't allow that that to happen. If you have a loved person around you and they're ill, you have a moral obligation not to let it tear you down because then it's on them. Right. That's no good. Yeah. And you think, well, how can you remain <clears throat> healthy and strong in the face of the terrible suffering of someone who's close to you? It's like, well, well you want because the old, suffer? That, yeah. well, that's it. The alternative <clears throat> is worse. One of the reasons why I mentioned that sensation, perception, feeling, thought, and action before is that the actions are very concrete. And because of this reciprocal relationship between the brain and body, brain connects to body, body connects to brain. When the mind isn't where we want it to be, we need to use the body to intervene. What does that mean? 